and minimalists. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are the Minimalists. Today, we're going to talk about what minimalism looks like when it's taken to its extremes. And we're going to do that with today's guest. Uh, Ewam is in the studio. As you'll notice, I'm actually Thanks not... Thanks for being here, Ewam. So you'll, here. <laughs> you'll notice I'm actually not in uh, the studio today, and it's because I am self-quarantining. I have a few cold-like symptoms, and I don't know whether or not that is the coronavirus, but I want everyone to be safe. And so I am here at home. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can see that I'm seated in my living room where we're having this conversation. So you, <laughs> you may not get the same pristine sort of uh, audio that you would usually get, but we're doing our best to make it as high quality as possible. Now, you, um, uh, thank you so much for being in the studio with us. You have an amazing YouTube channel. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. It's called <laughs> Heal Your Living. And yeah. people often hear Ryan and, and I talk about uh, minimalism not being a, a radical lifestyle. It's often a practical lifestyle, except sometimes you can get extreme. It is a, it is a spectrum. And, and the thing that I really like about minimalism, it's malleable for people who have multiple kids, but it's also malleable for people who want to take it a bit farther and, and let go of even more and sort of test their limits. And I think you do a great job of communicating that on your YouTube channel. You, you sort of bring an extreme approach, and, and I'm using that word because you use that word. What what propelled you or, or what convinced you that extreme minimalism was a, a, a meaningful way to live? Well, first of all, thanks for having me here. It's so nice to be in your presence. And so I started minimalism five years ago back in New York, and I just didn't use that label extreme actually until I started my channel and I just felt that because I was so deep into my own life cultivating my own practice and continuing my journey and being a minimalist from New York to making my move to Austin and having that practice be there for me for five years I just didn't know that what my lifestyle was can be perceived as extreme and then I had people telling me that yeah, when you show yourself and really share your life with other people, these these kind of choices that you make may be very extreme for a lot of people, especially in American standards. Right. So I started to think about how I can demonstrate a different kind of minimalism and in terms of um, limitation that is going the limitation that's more um, on a conscious everyday level mm -hmm. and I wanted to kind of use that word to convey that part of myself yeah yeah no mm -hmm. I, I think that's great like would you d do you feel like you are in deprivate do you feel like you're, you're depriving yourself every day mm -hmm. um, because what when I, when I see your YouTube channel when I see your lifestyle it does seem a bit extreme compared to, you know, how many things me and my wife own or, the, you know, the, the way that we uh, accumulate things. Uh, you know, if it came to things, you would you put Josh and I to shame, you know, like you're, you're the real minimalist. If, 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 it, if that's what it was. She totally about. wins the competition. She, she totally wins the competition. Um, but 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 I don't see you depriving yourself. I, I see you living in an intentional way where I, I feel like you're not living in deprivation. W would you agree with that? Definitely. Yeah. I think the conscious limitation that I share is only a selective part of myself just because I want to get the message through that this is possible mm. and that I can thrive and be happy in this kind of limited environment mm. where I'm very high, highly intentional with my limitations. So. Now Yes. You, you, I want to dive into a few things with you. I want to talk about some of the things you don't buy. I want to talk about your furniture-free minimalist apartment. I want to talk to you about your laundry routine and sound minimalism and a bunch of other things. But yeah. uh, we usually start this show off as a, a listener-driven show. I was hoping maybe we could hop into a few of our callers and answer some of their oh, questions. Yeah. How about awesome. we start? Yeah. How about we start with Jamie in Zanesville, Ohio? When you have achieved the goal of becoming a minimalist. What is the next goal or steps to progress towards? I've already minimized my stuff, bad relationships, etc. Plus, I live in a tiny house, and I also rent a space out 
to guests on Airbnb. So I have been able to decrease my working hours, too. I just want to keep refining and curating. So where should I be going at this point with my journey in minimalism? Now, you, um, it, it seems to me that uh, we often mistake the the destination with the the path there. And for me, minimalism tends to be the path. And Jamie has set minimalism up as the destination, as as the sort of goal. And and I think when we do that, if we make the goal to buy a hammer, that's a weird goal, right? It, it, we need the hammer as a tool to maybe fix something. And and for me, minimalism was a tool that allowed me to to simplify my life. And what I've noticed with you and, and your YouTube channel, I've noticed that you have used minimalism minimalism to to radically simplify your life and Mm -hmm. and there does become a point though where it's no longer just about simplifying it's about getting the stuff out of the way to make room for Mm -hmm. something else right yes definitely i feel that for me minimalism is not really the ultimate place that i want to arrive at but it's the process and Mm -hmm. i think minimalism for me is actually the result of letting go within so i know that a lot of people approach minimalism with physically decluttering and physically letting go of the material things but for me the material things i'm able to let go because i've worked on the inner self and letting go of the attachment Mm. as well as the obsession that i have to material identity or anything that i am obsessed and craving so the physical conditions of a simple home of uh, a minimal aesthetic is just the manifestation of what I've doing, been doing inside. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I love that you say that because you are, you're kind of at where Jamie is talking about. Mm-hmm. Like, yes, you, you don't have any furniture. You, uh, you wash your clothes by hand. You have these practices that uh, you could look at just the items and say, oh, like, okay, I'm officially a minimalist. But you're, <laughs> you're able to uh, use that as a way to live your life. And I, I think when I hear Jamie asking, what I really hear him asking is, what does he do with his time now? Mm. Because what he has done is he has, it sounds like he's cut back on his bills. He's got a tiny house. He, he's living, you know, this this ostensible minimal lifestyle. Mm. So the question I hear him asking is, now what do I do with my reclaimed time? Right. And, and what I love about your channel is like you've got, for example, you've got, hey, this is what it looks like uh, when I work. This is a day of work for me. And, and I would really highly recommend that Jamie check out your channel, you own, because that is, <laughs> because that is certainly, uh, it's a good example of what to do. Actually, it's not even a guide of what to do. I think mm. what your YouTube channel shows is a recipe. You're like, Hey, mm. I have totally minimized my stuff. Now here's what I do with my time. Mm. And, and, uh, Jamie needs to decide for himself how his time can be best spent, but certainly, um, you know, Josh and I, what we do with our time, what Josh and I do are different. What you do is different. And and I think the hardest part about when you have reclaimed your time, it is figuring out like, oh no, now I've got to be by myself. What do I do now? Mm. Right. And uh, And, and Ryan, what I would say there is get really clear on what your values are because each of us might value different things, even though we we approach life with the, the sort of minimal lens or the minimalist's lens and and we're simplifying things but then once we're making room for something important we need to figure out what we value and so jamie i'm going to recommend uh we actually have a free values worksheet on our website Uh, there's an essay there called how to understand your values and you can download that values worksheet and really get clear on the different types of values you know we, we have these sort of foundational values, then we have the structural values, we have the surface values, and we have uh, the imaginary values, which are quite often the things that we thought were important in life, but mm-hmm. minimalism helps us let go of those things that are imaginary, the the things that are in the way, so we can focus on what we actually value. And I'll tell you, Jamie, you can never go wrong with contributing. It's like my whole goal with what Josh and I do is I want people to feel like they have enough, A, because there's a sense of security when you realize like, oh, I do have enough and, and you can kind of uh, deal with those impulses and deal with that constant wanting because that's the society we live in. It is like this constant state of wanting. I mean, look at the panic buying that's happening right now. It's like people feel like they have to uh, accumulate in order to stay safe. And what Josh and I and you, you and what we're trying to explain to people is like, yes, you do need some things, but it might not be as much as you need. And when people feel like they have enough, 
that is when they start to look externally. I think you can totally give, uh, even though you know maybe you're in this state of wanting, or or maybe you're you, you know you're someone who's very poor. Like I think it's it's still it's still totally possible to give. However, I think when we feel like we have enough, it's it makes us feel like it's easier to mm-hmm. give. So uh, Jamie, you can never go wrong with contributing your time to to helping out your community and to to helping out society. Well, our next question is from Tracy in West Lafayette, Indiana. I have heard you talk about your about your kitchen, excuse me, and how you would be even more of a minimalist in the kitchen if you lived alone. I was curious what you eat and if you could give some insight on your minimalist way of life in the kitchen. All right, so yes, I have said this in the past. That I mean, right now, if you're actually looking at the video version of this, you can see my living room. It is relatively sparse. But if you go into my kitchen, uh, my wife is a dietitian and a nutritionist, and she requires more instruments than I might require, more tools than I might require if I were living on. She likes my to cook, own. so yeah, she's absolutely. got all the cooking devices. Yeah, <laughs> you know, Ryan. It's funny you say that. I think that um, I've rarely had a need for a kitchen at all in in the past when I was living on my own. Um, Dude, when you and I were living together, all we needed was the the rice cooker. <laughs> Even yeah, we we were in the cabin in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, dude. I mean that we literally could have went without a stove and just used the rice cooker, and we would have been okay. <laughs> I don't know that we ever even turned the stove on. <laughs> yeah, I can't, I but, can't think of where. But yeah, and so so the question is, what are the appropriate tools? Because quite often, and you, um, I, I'm sure you you can recognize this too with your experimentation. But quite often, we we think that we need the things that other people think they need or other people think we need. And so if I see a blender in someone else's house, I'm going to get that. Or if I see a juicer, I'm going to get that. Or if I'm going to see this particular skillet or a wok or a spatula or whatever, and there's nothing inherently wrong with any of those things. The question is, are they appropriate for me? And am I, am I going to use those things? Or did someone else tell me that I need them? Yeah. So what's your kitchen look like, Ewan? My kitchen is pretty maximal (laughs) in my standards because that's where all the action goes on in my house because I eat a plant-based raw, 80-20 raw vegan lifestyle. Mm. So there's a lot of blenders and food processors, which is not that minimal. (laughs) But again, to me, it's not really about curating the perfect minimalist lifestyle and then matching my kitchen Mm. to fit into that minimalist standard. But it's more so that I just listen to how I'm going to nourish my body in the best way that I can within my budget, within my lifestyle and condition, and then manifesting or matching that physical condition to be to support the diet that I'm choosing. I think yeah. it's a great example, you know, yeah. because even for someone like you who has no, you know, no furniture in your living room, like to, to still show a piece of your life where you're like, hey, I probably have more utensil or not utensils but more uh devices to cook with yeah. than maybe the average person but it's very intentional mm. and you know it's interesting i i will you know josh and i we will swap out minimalism for intentionalism mm. or enoughism because sometimes you know when you hear that word minimalism you think oh i've got to like be a monk with bare white walls and yeah. just eat rice for the rest of my life <laughs> and uh the the fact that there is still a balance there uh i think that's i think that's an awesome example mm. um they asked the the question also to josh was what's our diet and to ask josh what his diet is right now i, I don't think anyone uh although, although maybe paul saladino would agree with what your diet is mm-hmm. um but right now i mean jo- josh uh, yeah talk about what your diet looks like right now <laughs> Yeah, well, my, my diet has to do with I have a lot of dietary restrictions just based on you know, the the ulcers that I have in my small intestine, and so um, it radically limits what I'm able to eat. And unfortunately, I'm not able to eat you know many plants or much fiber right now. Mm-hmm. And and so I have I have an extremely limited diet, but that one is out of necessity, right? And and so mm-hmm. sometimes it's about intention with respect to the things we remove from our life because. We think it will serve us better, but sometimes we have to we have to remove things out of necessity, and I think that's the an, an important distinction to make because you um, you might have quite a few things in your kitchen, probably not relative to the average American household, but relative to your living room. Now, but if I were to swap out your your blender for a couch, 
that would actually that 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 would not serve a purpose. In fact, it would get in the way of what you're trying to accomplish with with your own lifestyle. And so, uh, us trying to live like someone else because someone else has a couch or someone else has a blender. The question then is, what is appropriate for my life so that uh, I can live a a practical life with less stuff? And, and quite often, I think that involves simplifying. Now, Tracy, I'd love to send you a copy of our book, Everything That Remains. Uh, it's the story of, of me and Ryan. We were out in that cabin in the middle of nowhere when we wrote this book, actually. And, and it's a story of us being these suit and tie corporate guys having way, way, way too much stuff, but then sort of radically simplifying our lives to find and live a more practical life. And even Ryan's and my version of minimalism might be extreme for some people, but what we try to show in that book is it's actually a much more practical lifestyle than you might suspect by getting rid of the excess we're able to really figure out and then focus on what's truly important so tracy if you like our podcast you'll like the audiobook version of everything that remains or if you want the book book or the ebook version i'd be happy to send those to you as well ryan what josh, time is it josh i think you just came up with a really good reality show idea what's i think that? it's going to be called would you rather have a couch <laughs> oh you know what time it is it is time for our lightning round where we answer your text messages you can text your questions and comments to 937-202-4654 yes indeed uh, those text messages actually go straight to both of our phones and so during this whole uh, pandemic right now, which we've already covered extensively on this podcast. You can text us. We've got a little bit more time. Also, uh, once this whole pandemic's over, we will be setting up some new free meetups in different cities throughout the United States and Canada. And if you want details about those, the only way you're going to find out is if you are on our text message group. Now, we can't answer every question, but we do our best to reply to as many people as we can. And we even answer some questions on the podcast during this lightning round. Now, now the lightning round you, um, what we try to do is we answer, answer questions with just a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. And we put the text to these minimal maxims in the show notes so people can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if they'd like. And by the way, folks can find all of our minimal maxims in one place now over at minimalmaxims.com. But you, um, uh, don't worry. We just ramble on a little bit. People ask questions, and then Sean makes it beautiful in the, uh, the show notes. Ryan, what's our he question sure from Cody? Does. Cody wants to know, Josh and Ewam, what is the absolute minimum number of physical items you think you would need to survive? 413. <laughs> oh, I was going to say 412. <laughs> you minimalist. <laughs> you was going to say because I don't need oh. underwear. <laughs> here's here's my pithy answer and you i'd love to hear what you have to say about this but my short answer is don't confuse surviving with thriving and ryan earlier talked about you know, deprivation we don't want to deprive ourselves of the things that we need but sometimes we can temporarily deprive ourselves we can remove something for, from our life for a period of time and determine whether or not it was actually adding value and then we can bring it back in in a more deliberate sort of way but if we we can get Get rid of anything and, and so Co cody's question about the minimum number of physical items you need to survive i don't want to just survive i mean maybe that that number is close to zero right we look at our yeah. ancestors you look at pre-civilization we didn't even own things maybe we had a spear or maybe we had you know a, a few tools but only what we could carry on our person and mm. and so i think the number is probably close to zero but that's not thriving necessarily. And so maybe the better question is, how many items do you need personally to, to thrive? You and what do you think about that? Well, for me, I feel like it depends on what your method of survival is. So if your method of survival is having good people around, uh, feeding off of their energy and then emanating good energy and vibration, then that to me is my own way of survival. So then I need zero things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that. Um, no, it's such a good point. I mean, what, what people need to survive, it's going to be it's going to be different for each person. Uh, my, my pithy answer is this. Monks live with nothing. Minimalists live with what's appropriate. And that's really what we're talking about here mm. is what's appropriate for your life 
Cody. I mean, if you want to challenge yourself and do like some kind of uh, man in the wild situation where you're living with absolutely nothing and seeing if you can survive, you know, good on you. Uh, Josh and I, that's not what how we want to survive. And um, that's not an experiment that I want to do myself. Uh, but yeah, if we're focusing on the number of things, I think we're focusing on the wrong things. Yeah, you. But it doesn't seem to me that you you are necessarily counting your items, and and it, you you have in your life what is appropriate for you right now. But it, you also seem, you know, based off the videos I've watched of yours on on your YouTube channel, it, it seems to me that you're willing to adjust that if you think something is going to add value to your life, you're willing to bring it back in. And also, if something stops adding value to your life, you're obviously willing to let it go as well. Yeah. You know, Josh, I was talking and you, I was talking to my grandmother this morning because I had to ship her facial tissue because there's no toilet paper for her. She lives <laughs> at this retirement community and they were able to give her a couple rolls, uh, but, you know, just enough to get by until I shipped her some facial tissue because I couldn't find toilet paper anywhere. And she was explaining to me, uh, she grew up in Germany, um, in Lonsuit, Germany. It's just outside of Munich during uh, uh, World War II. And she was explaining to me how little that she had to live with during those war times. And she was kind of going on and on about the people uh, that's in her community that are just, um, they have no idea what it's like to live with nothing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, she was telling me things about how uh, literally she would get like a slice of bread and an apple for lunch. And she was so hungry as a kid, she would eat it on the way to school. So she wouldn't have a, have a lunch. And the teacher would end up like when all the kids were gone, she would pull my grandmother aside and she'd be like, here, here, have my apple. Cause you know, the kids would, that's what they used to do with teachers is bring them apples or a pear or whatever she had. Uh, one time all they had were egg noodles and jelly. And that's what her mom made for dinner. And it was just, I mean, so you know, you don't need a lot to survive, but, you know, living in a situation like that, I, I, I totally agree with you, Josh. It's, it's not thriving. All right. Before we get into our added value segment and our listener tips today, it looks like we got a bunch more surprise questions to talk about this week. Ryan, let's see here. What are the pros and cons, if any, of extreme minimalism? Do you know any extreme minimalists with kids? I'm going to say yes to that, but I'm also going to give you some examples. Also, are you truly happy here are the real questions talk- <laughs> <laughs> well we're, we're going to talk to uh you um, about the things she doesn't buy anymore as an extreme minimalist what are some of the things that she refuses to buy and why she doesn't buy them we're going to talk about her furniture free apartment which i am just astounded by i love her video about this but i want her to expand on it also we'll talk about her minimalist laundry routine her sound minimalism. We're going to talk about sleeping in a hammock. She doesn't have a bed, but she sleeps in a hammock. We're going to talk about living with someone else, even though you are an extreme minimalist and they are not. And we're also going to talk about extreme minimalist cleaning at home. Plus, we got a bunch more questions for you. And if you want to hear all that, Listen to this week's Maximal episode on the Minimalist Private Podcast. That's right. You're currently listening to our weekly Minimal episode, but each week, Ryan and I and our guests record an entirely different, much longer Maximal episode on the Minimalist Private Podcast. It's just two bucks, and it is the most honest way for this podcast to earn an income because we don't believe in advertisements. You know, we think advertisements suck. So we make money only if you find value in and support what we create. This is especially important right now in these trying times where Ryan and I are relying on the the podcast to get this message of minimalism out to more people than ever because we're not able to do some of the speaking gigs or the touring that we would typically do. So the podcast is a great way for us to share this message and you can support that at theminimalists.com slash support. By the way, When you subscribe to the Minimalist Private Podcast, you'll also receive a personal link so that our maximal episodes play in your favorite podcast app. This is an entirely separate endeavor, and you can find it at theminimalists.com slash support. Ryan, what else you got for us this week? Here are some voicemail comments and tips from our listeners. Check them out. I was listening to a TED Talk by David Christian, who talks about big history. In his talk, he started with the Big Bang and the beginning of the universe. But at one point he said, gravity is more powerful when there's more stuff. I think this applies not only to the universe, but to our lives. Cluttered rooms, tables, and desks invite more clutter to gravitate to it. For those who feel overwhelmed, I make this suggestion. Pick a space, your desk, your dining room table, your bedroom, and have a minor packing party. 
take everything out of the area, clean it thoroughly, then only allow back in or on what belongs there as you need it. Once you've cleared the area, make it a priority to keep it cleared. For me, this started in my bedroom, which became a tidy, restful sanctuary. Now nothing comes in that doesn't belong and everything is put in its place immediately. Then it's spread to the dining room table, a notorious horizontal surface that used to invite clutter. Slowly, my entire house became more tidy without me ever saying anything to my family. No one wanted to be the person who threw stuff down on the dining room table as it was clean and had fresh flowers on it. We all now take pride in our tidy home without me once ever preaching minimalism. As the clutter disappeared, the spaces became easier to maintain and the entire family feels less stressed. We did a couple of birthdays and Christmases and tried to ask people not to bring gifts, but of course, family members always want to give you stuff. And honestly, I usually let the kids play with it for a week or so, and it all ends up at the thrift store anyways. So this last year, we decided to start adopting animals. And we have an animal ark that is just outside of Reno that rescues and rehabilitates um, wild animals and animals that have been raised in captivity and whatnot but you can donate to them. You can pick which animal you want to adopt and you can donate to them throughout the year. So we adopted a wolf and at any of our kids' birthdays, we now put on the invitation that if they'd like to bring a present, if they'd like to donate money to the wolf, they can. We also adopted an elephant. I think we actually just fed the elephant for a day. Um, from the elephant sanctuary which is located in tennessee we adopted an elephant for my mom for christmas a couple years ago so now since she loves elephants she gets a monthly email newsletter about how her elephant is doing and she really loves that so that could be a great way to get people involved they feel happy giving you something and then they can continue to follow that animal online all right, y'all. Thanks again to UM for joining us today. Please check out her YouTube channel. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. I think you're really going to enjoy her videos. She has a lot of them, and you can really appreciate the aesthetic side of extreme minimalism, but then go way beyond the aesthetics to the sort of inner peace that she helps people create. And real quick, for right here, right now, here is one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalists. We're back to vlogging uh, over on YouTube. Uh, you can check out our new vlog. It's called A Meaningful Life, episode number three. Ryan, you and I, and, and podcast Sean, and Jordan No More. We just went out to Utah last month, and we captured a bunch of, a bunch of footage of us roaming around Utah in the winter. We went to a jazz game, but also... Most important, we finished the soundtrack to our next film, Less Is Now. And we were down there with Nate Pfeiffer and the folks from We, which is the band that they created just for our first film. And now they're, they've come back together to do the soundtrack for our second film. And you can check out our vlog from our entire journey over to Utah. We also did an unscripted Utah meetup where we just sent a text message out to our text message group. By the way, you can join us for any of our future unscripted events. Just send us a text message to get added to our list, 937-202-4654. If you do that, you also get our Monday morning minimal maxims. Every Monday, we start your week off with just a pithy phrase to help inspire you for the week. Over on our YouTube channel, though, check out episode three of A Meaningful Life. It is our newest vlog of us exploring Utah and uh, trying to live a meaningful life while we travel. You can follow The Minimalists on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, at The Minimalists. If you have a question, comment, or minimalism tip for our podcast, just email voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. You can comment on this episode at youtube.com slash theminimalists. And if you want our show notes in your inbox, sign up for our email list over at theminimalists.com right there at the top. You'll also receive our simple Sunday emails each week, some new writings about minimalism, Never junk, never spam, never advertisements because we don't believe in any, any of those things. Now, Ryan, for our added value this week, have you heard Jay Electronica's new album? I have not. I'll have to check it. I've never even heard of Jay Electronica. Well, here's the thing. Back in like 2009, he, he was sort of touted as the next big thing, the next Jay-Z or Nas. Mm. And then for 11 years, he never put out an album. He had a couple like just Lucy's songs that were out, but... 
nothing that was a full body of work. Uh, he had this amazing song back in 2009 called Exhibit C, which was just this, um, I mean, this ex- exceptional expression of penmanship and lyricism. What an amazing song it was. And now he's finally released his debut album. It's, it's called A Written Testimony. But here's something unique about this. Jay-Z is on almost every song on this album. And hmm. there's only nine songs on the album. And so people are con- comparing it to the Watch the Throne album from 2011, even though it's it's not that at all. It's a completely different endeavor. But it's Jay Electronica, but also featuring Jay-Z throughout most of the album. The, the song I want to finish with today is a song called Never Ending Story. If you leave here today with just one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. The Minimalists.